in prayer about what the Lord would have us say today and do in this service. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 31. Pray for us this week. I'm going to be preaching in another Bible conference in Monroe, North Carolina. I'm going to leave out, uh, Lord willing, either late this evening or early in the morning. And uh, then we'll be back um, this week sometime around Wednesday. Got to get back to work. Got to get back to work. Can't have, uh, can't have too many people down there working for me. Amen. That's right, Eric. So he's going to cover for me for a couple of days. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 22 and verse number 31. The Bible says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, he said, Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. That's an old terminology that we use. My grandmother's got a little sifter that she uses when she makes them cat eye biscuits. And uh, she'll sift that wheat with that sifter. And we'll deal with that in just a minute. But look at verse number 32. I love what Jesus said to Peter. Jesus said, but I have prayed for thee. Aren't you glad this morning that we have an advocate with the Father? We have a go-between. We have an intercessor the man, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad he's Lord this morning. He said, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And then he said this to Peter. He said, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Notice what Peter said. And I believe he said this in the flesh. He said to Jesus, he said, Lord, he said, I'm ready to go with thee both into prison and and to death. And Jesus predicted this, prophesied accurately like he always does. He said, I tell thee, Peter, that the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt deny that thou knowest me. He said, that will happen three times. He said, thrice, he said, you'll deny me before the cock crows in the morning. And then we go on down through the verses of Scripture and you can read about the arrest of Jesus Christ. I'm interested this morning in verse number 32 where Jesus said this. He said, Peter, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And I'm going to give you a simple thought and then we'll go to the house. Amen. Father, we love you. We thank you for the reading of your word. We thank you for the scriptures this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the Sunday school hour. Thank you for uh, these visitors here this morning that came our way. I pray, God, that you'd bless every heart, bless every life. And Father, we know that all things are in your hands and God, you're in all control. And I ask you, Lord, today that you would touch us and you would speak to us today from your holy word. Lord, you'd bless us this week as we travel. Lord, as we're in the Bible conference, that you would touch, uh, Lord, there in Monroe, North Carolina. Lord, I pray for traveling mercies. God, I pray that you would bless every heart, bless every life. And Father, I pray that you'd use the word today. Speak to us and we'll thank and we'll praise you for all that you've done, all that you're doing, and all that you're going to do. For we ask all things. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. He said that thy faith fail not. I want to look down at verse number 54. We're going to skip over a few verses for time's sake. And when we get down to verse number 54, I want to show you a few things real quickly that did fail in Peter's life. And by the way, if you're here today and you're saved and you're born again, you've been washed in the blood, um, there are things in your life that will fail. But I'm glad one thing that will not fail is our faith. Look at verse number 54. The Bible says, And when they took him, and led him and brought him to the high priest house, Peter followed afar off. Peter followed afar off. By this time, the disciples had went into hiding. By this time, they had uh, walked away from the Savior. And when Jesus found them, they were in the upper room a couple of chapters later. That's where they were all meeting and gathering together. The Bible said in verse number 55, And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall, and where sat down together, Peter sat down among them. So we notice that Peter is following Jesus afar off. And he sits down around a fire around the enemies. 
So the first thing I want you to notice, the very first thing that failed for Peter was his flesh. And there's one thing that I found out in this life, our flesh is weak. Amen. Amen. Our flesh is weak. There's nothing about our flesh that's saved. There's nothing about our flesh that is born again. And there's nothing about our flesh that truly, that truly has anything holy or spiritual about it. Matter of fact, it's the, it's the avenue in which God allows us to live and breathe in this life. But what's saved is the, the inner man, the spiritual man. When Peter comes to this place, he tells Jesus, he said, listen, he said, I'll go with you even unto death. I'll go with you through the pits of hell. And Jesus looked at him and said, Peter, I'm going to tell you something. Your flesh is going to fail. Your flesh is going to follow afar off. Everybody, everybody says, you know, and I'm, I'm sure you you've heard this before, I'm behind you 100%. Well, that's what Peter told the Lord. He said, Lord, I'm behind you 100%. And he was right. He was about two miles behind Jesus. Amen. He was nowhere near the Lord. He followed afar off. The Bible says this, and then a certain maid beheld him that sat by the fire, and she earnestly looked upon him and said, this man was also with him. And so now we find out that there's a damsel, there's a man maid that, that notifies Peter, that recognizes Peter. And the Bible says that he denied and said, woman, I know him not. And then after a while, another one said, thou art one of them. And Peter said, man, I'm not. So a man identifies him. A woman identifies him as being a, a disciple, as being a uh, Christian as being a follower of Christ. And then about the space of one hour, another confidently affirmed saying of truth, this fellow also with them, or also was with him, for he is a Galilean. So not only did Peter's flesh fail him, but I'm going to tell you something else about Peter. His fame failed him. Amen. You know, a lot of people put stock in their fame. They put stock in their name. They say, oh, look at me, look at my name, look at what I've done and they put their stock in what man has accomplished and what the flesh has accomplished. Peter was a very well-known disciple. Matter of fact, it was Peter that God allowed in the inner circle when he raised the damsel from the, de from the dead, you know, Jairus' daughter. He allowed Peter, James, and John to walk in there during the resurrection of Jairus' daughter and so on. He was there at Mount Transfiguration. And so Peter had experienced the resurrecting power of the Son of God. He experienced the the Mount Transfiguration of the Son of God. And I think a lot of that fame got to Peter's head thinking, who am I that would deny, that would forsake the Lord? But Peter's fame failed him. He, he told him three times, I don't know. I'm not that man. And other passages of Scripture, you got to read the book of Mark, the book of Matthew. You'll find that he even cussed and said, I don't even know who Jesus is. But when you look at this passage of Scripture, you notice it's just Peter. Peter by himself. Where's the other disciples? Where's the other men that followed, that stayed with him? Where's John? Where's James? I find that not only did his flesh fail him, not only did his fame fail him, but his friends failed him. Amen. Amen. You know, the old songwriter said, though no, though no one join me, still I will follow. And I think a lot of times as a child of God and as a Christian, Lord allow us to go through things without friends and without family and face things on our own to develop our faith and to develop us in Christ. But I want you to notice verse number 62. The Bible says, verse number 61, and the Lord turned and he looked upon Peter and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him before the cock crowed, thou shalt deny me thrice. Now look at this. The Bible said, and Peter went out... Sit with me and wept bitterly. Not only did his flesh fail him, his fame failed him, his friends failed him, but I say that Peter's fortitude failed him. His pride. You know what the Bible says about pride? The Bible says that pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. You ever met anybody so prideful, so arrogant, they think they're better than everybody else? Our, my pastor, when I was growing up as a kid, he said, I met a fellow the other day. He said, I was praying, dear God, don't let it rain. 
He said, because I knew if it were to rain, the man would have drowned. He had his nose stuck so far up in the air. Amen. The proud look. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven is an abomination unto him. A proud look. The Bible says God resisteth the proud, but God gives grace to the humble. And I tell you what, God has put me personally through the ringer and my family. I'll never forget when we first got married. Man, I thought, man, I could charge hell with a water pistol, squirt the devil in both eyes. And then after about two or three miscarriages and up and downs in and out of uh, doctor's rooms and burying friends and family and going through just life. Here I am going to be 35 tomorrow and I promise you one thing. I know a whole lot less now than what I knew when I was 16. Can I get a witness this morning? Amen. But Peter was young. He was on fire for God. He wanted to serve the Lord with all this vigor. But when we find Peter in the latter part of Luke 22, he walks out and he's weeping bitterly. His fortitude had failed him. His friends had failed him. His fame had failed him. And his flesh had failed him. But can I tell you this morning on the authority of the Word of God, when our flesh fails us, when our fame fails us, when our friends fail us, when our fortitude fails us, I'm glad we've got a heavenly Father in heaven. I'm glad we've got a go-between. We've got somebody that works on our end and does for us what we can't do for ourselves. And the Bible says in our text verse, he said, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat, but Peter, I have prayed for thee. I'm glad this morning, amen, God has already been there. I saw a church sign the other day going to work down in commerce and I thought, man, what a powerful sign. It says, why worry about tomorrow because Jesus is already there. Aren't you glad for that this morning to know that he's got the whole world in his hands? He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got all control, all power. The Bible says that the heart of the king is in the Lord's hands. I'm glad to know I'm on the winning side. Bible said if God be for us, then who can be against us? Nay, in all these things shall we be more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Shall tribulation, distress, pearl, nakedness, shall any of these things separate us from the love of God? None of these things shall separate us from the love of God because God loves his children. Last time I checked, Psalms 100 said we are the sheep of his pasture. Amen. I'm glad. I'm glad Hallelujah. I know the shepherd and I've been grazing in his field. Amen. What a field of grace. There's three things I want you to notice this morning and we'll be done. Look at our passage of scripture. Notice here in the passage of scripture, verse number 31, the Bible said, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Notice what Jesus said. He told Peter, he said, Peter, he said, I just need to let you know in on something. He said, Satan has desired to have you. Mark her down, good neighbor, before the devil can ever do anything or say anything to his people. He's got to get permission from headquarters. You read the text. He said, Satan hath desired to have you. Jesus already knew in advance what was going to happen. He already knew what was going to Matter of fact, if you read the story of Job, in Job chapter number one, you remember what Satan did? He went before the Lord several times and he said, he said, listen, he said, I've considered your servant Job. He said, but there's none like him in the earth. He said, and there's a hedge around about Job. You know what? This morning, a, there, there is a hedge about God's people that we can't see, we can't touch, we can't see it with the naked eye, but I'm telling you that the satanic powers that be, the prince and the power of the air, though he has limited power, he has power, principality, power, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places, is what the scripture says. And so we find out in this passage of scripture, he has to have permission from God to sift Peter. If God said, no, you can't have Peter, he wouldn't have been sifted it is we. Right. 
And so Jesus is forewarning him, Satan has desired to have you. He's longing to sift you. He's longing to turn your life upside down. He's longing to mix you inside out. Now let me tell you something. You, we, we go through storms, we go through trials, and a lot of them takes us by surprise. And we say, well, I didn't see that coming. You know, you, 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 listen, tomorrow's Monday. There's, we, we don't know what tomorrow holds. We, ha we have no idea what tomorrow may bring. But I do know this, that if I wake up in the morning and I get a telephone call and it's from the doctor that says we've got some bad news from a test result that we had, can I tell you something? Jesus already knew about it. Amen. He already knew before you got the bad news what was going to happen. And by the way, if anything comes in our life, and if God allows it, it's for our good and for our betterment. We've got to realize that. He needs permission before he deals with any of his people. He said, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. And by the way, you know what that means when you sift wheat, when you're want wanting to uh, use wheat and flour and grain? You can't cook it with big lumps in it. It's got to be ground down into that fine powder to be able to make those wonderful cat eye biscuits. Praise God. Boy, those cat head biscuits. That's right. Thank God for those cat head eye ears biscuits. Amen. You got to grind the flour down. You've got to knock, knock off all the rough edges. You've got to get those lumps out for God to be able to use your life. And I'm telling you, the more God breaks and the more God God molds and the more God allows things to come in your life the more he can use you the more God can bless you amen so he has permission then I want you to notice this he said he's desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat but look at verse number 32 he said this he said but I have prayed for thee notice that's past tense Jesus didn't say Peter I'm going to pray for you Notice he didn't say, I'm going to pray about praying for you. You know, some people pray about praying. Well, we're going to pray about coming to church. We're going to pray about praying, pray about reading my Bible. You know what Jesus said? I have prayed for thee. Aren't you glad that we serve a God this morning that already has prayed for you and has prayed for me? And I'm going to be honest with you, there's several things that, I've, that, I, that I thought I figured out and I thought I could figure it out and I thought I could, you know, make certain things happen. But I'm telling you something, at the end of the day, no, 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 no. You know who's got it figured out? The one in control, the one that, that has all power, the one that's already prayed. By the way, who do you want praying for you? There's sometimes, hey, there's some things mama can't pray about. There's some things daddy can't pray about. There's some things sissy can't pray about. I got a wonderful sister. I love her with all my heart. I've called her. She's called me. She'll call me up. She'll say, Adam, listen. She said, this is what's going on. I can't tell mom. I can't tell dad. She said, but would you please pray for me? And I'll tell her, yes, Laura, I'll pray for you. And I'll ask God to meet your needs. Sometimes I'll call her. I'll say, Laura, I want you to pray for me. But you know, there's sometimes, you know, Laura's prayers just ain't going to work. Mom and dad's prayers just won't work. You know, brother, sister, uh, uh, grandparent. I'm going to tell you something. There's a prayer that does work. There is a prayer that does work. You say, who is it? He, he's, called the, he's called the advocate to the Father. He's called the go-between. He's called our intercessor. He is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews said, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain help and find grace to help in the time of need. Aren't you glad that we've got the, the, the power of Jesus Christ and the power Power of the Lord. And by the way, when Jesus is praying, things happen. When Jesus is talking, hey dad, this is what it's like. Hey dad, brother Adam needs you. Hey dad, brother Maynard needs you. Hey dad, hey brother Chambers needs you. Hey dad, that's how it works. And I'm telling you, when you can get a hold of Jesus and you can get at the feet of Jesus, life changes for the child of God. Do you know who I prayed to the night I got saved? Jesus. I didn't go to Mother Mary. 
I didn't have to go to Mary. Thank God I didn't have to go to Mary. I didn't have to get on the phone and try to find out where the Pope was or the Pope Mobile. Amen. Didn't have to get in touch with the Pope. Didn't have to call the church. Didn't have to call my pastor. Didn't have to call a deacon. Didn't have to call a trustee. Hey, I didn't have to call a lawyer. I didn't have to call a doctor. I didn't have to call mom or dad. You know who I got on the got on the phone with? I called, praise God, Jeremiah 33 3. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. The night I got saved, I called on Jesus' name. I said, Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner. God saved my wretched soul. And you know what God did that very moment? Honey, about two and a half acres of heaven fell down, and glory filled my soul. And I'm glad I passed from death unto life. And I know what it's like to be saved, born again, blood washed, redeemed, on my way to heaven. That's something the world can't offer a man. Brother Alex went down there the other night and preached down at the 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 uh, the homeless mission down in Gainesville. Him and Brother Jason and them guys. Listen, they're down there trying to help these boys that don't have a home. They're trying to help these guys that don't have a house. They're trying to help these people that don't have no way. And I, and they're trying to work on them and help them. But you know the most important thing they need. It's not a place to stay for the night. It's not the next meal. They need Jesus. If they had Jesus, if they had the Holy Ghost, if they had God working for them, honey, he'll take care of the rest. You know, the government tries to do that. They'll clean man from the outside in, and it don't work that way. God works from the inside out. There's things God do for you AA can't do. Amen? Drug rehab can't do. I'm glad to know, praise God, there's nothing like Jesus. The world goes through their troubles and their trials and tribulations and they turn to drugs and they turn to pharmaceuticals and they, they turn to Budweiser and they try to drink away their misery and their problems. I'm going to tell you something. If I could ever take what God's put on the inside of me and put it in a bottle, I guarantee you I could put Bud Dumber, Budweiser out of business. It's life changing what God can do for you. I'm glad I've I got somebody that's praying for me. So there was the permission there was the prayer and then last but not least here's the promise watch what Jesus said Jesus said this he said Peter I tell thee today he said the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me there's the promise there's the prophecy you're gonna deny me you're going to mess up. You're going to fail. You're, you're going to fall flat on your face. But I want you to notice what he said, verse number 32. Here, here it is. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Now, he's not talking about being saved. We use that word converted all the time about being saved. That's not what he means. Peter was already saved. He was already born again. When Jesus found him, he was fishing for fish. And he said, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And he gave his life to the Lord. What he said was, when you have repented, when you've gotten right with God and you've gotten right with me, you're going to be able to strengthen the brethren when thou art converted. Think about that for a minute. That is a wonderful promise that only God can give to the fact that say, listen, you're going to fail. You're going to mess up. You're going to fall. But guess what? Your faith's not going to fail you. Your faith is unfailing. Therefore, there's repentance in your future. You know what the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9? If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. You know what? He's not asking you to come for forgiveness. He's asking you to just come and confess it. He'll forgive it. Amen? He'll forgive it. I want you to look at, if you want to, Brother Eric, you'll have to help me with these couple of scripture verses. Mark 16. And I want you to look at this. This is resurrection morning. Mark 16 and verse number 6. Mark 16 is resurrection. Jesus is getting up. It's the third day. Man, if you want to come back to pee and I'm done. I'm finished. I'm going to finish out with this. The Bible says this in Mark 16. 
The Bible said, verse 2, very early in the morning, the first day of the week, came them unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun, and when they saw themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were frightened. And he said unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. Behold the place where they've laid him. Now watch verse number 7. This is, this is from the angel to those that had got there to the tomb that morning. And listen at the message that was given to those early Christians that looked in that tomb. Listen at this. But go your way. Tell his disciples. Say it with me. And Peter. The, the last time we read about Peter, he's denied the Lord three times. And he went out and wept bitterly because his flesh failed him. His fortitude failed him. His fame had failed him. <laughs> but aren't you glad there's a God in heaven that don't fail us? And the word on Easter Sunday morning Go tell the disciples that Jesus is not here. He's risen. Yes, and Peter. Can you imagine being Peter? And they come and knock it on the door, the disciples. And they said, we just met with a couple of angelic beings. We just met with a few, we, we just met with a few angelic beings. They said to let y'all know that Jesus is alive and well. But not just y'all. They, they singled out and said, and Peter. I bet his heart was a beating on the inside saying, wow, he really does love me. He really does care. I'm glad he really does care about who we are and what we're going through. And what we stand in need of. It's just part of the promise. Look at John 21. John 21. Bible said in verse number 4 that when morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. He's in his resurrected body now. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. And Jesus said unto them, Children, have you any meat? And they said, No, we fished all night, didn't catch nothing. The Bible said when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he... He girded his fisher's coat and threw himself over the boat into the sea. And as soon as they were come to land, they saw that there was a fire of coals there and fish laid on and bread. The last time Peter was next to a fire, guess who was around him? A bunch of enemies. Aren't you glad God will let you change fires? He went from sitting around the fire with the enemy, now he's sitting around a fire with Jesus. This time he's ready to eat. Simon Peter went up and he drew the net to land with great fishes. The Bible said, come and dine. The Bible said this, Jesus come and take bread. And he gave to them the fish likewise. And this is the third time that Jesus showed himself to the disciples. And after that he was risen from the dead. Look at verse 15. So when they, had to, when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Well, that's, that's tough. You know, he just got through denying and cussing that he ever knew who he was. He said, yeah, Lord. Thou knowest that I love thee. He said, feed my lamb. He said to him again the second time, Simon, lovest thou me? And he said, yeah, Lord. Thou knowest that I love thee. He said, feed my sheep. This is so good. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved. 
Is everybody reading the same Bible I'm reading? Peter was grieved because he said it to him the third time, lovest thou me. Then he said unto him, he said, Lord, thou knowest all things. And thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Say, so why do you ask him three times, do you love me? Because he is going to forgive him for the three times that he denied him. I think he denied him three times, but he said, I love you three times. One for God the Father. One for God the Son. One for God the Holy Ghost. Listen to these words as I read them. Because you're not going to believe who wrote them. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. As some strange thing is happening to you. But rejoice in so much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. That when, when His glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, He is evil spoken of. But on your part, he's glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. And I know some people like that. Yet if any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God be? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? pushed out stuff here wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well doing listen to this as unto a faithful creator You want to take a wild guess who wrote those words? It's found in 1 